What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Season 2, Episode 1 of Creative Crunch. I just want to take a quick second to say thank you to everyone who uh, supported Season 1 and just um, nurtured me and really allowed me to kind of do this and use my gift of gab and turn it into something. Uh, So thank you to everyone uh, who listened to all of those episodes before. Uh, We had 646 total plays all time um, for season one, about 38 of you um, tuning into each episode, which just makes me super stoked because that's my goal is to kind of make this a class and to kind of keep this at class size. And so in my eyes, uh, 38 people is meeting that goal. And so I met that goal for season one. Uh, For season two, maybe just double those numbers. So all you have to do is let your friends know that you are listening to Creative Crunch and that you're really getting something from this. And that's my goal is to kind of take what I learn and take the conversations that I have with other creative people and just reflect on them in season two and really just kind of hone in on the core messages and rhetoric of what Creative Crunch is. That being said, let's jump right into it. Adding some background music to our first little bit. Intro. Intro to season two. Add. Okay, not yet. Tools. Songs. Yeah, interludes. Let's see what we got here. Let's just throw this in there. Add. Okay, record. Oh, is this all together? Okay. Tools. So the theme of season two, episode one, is going to be the death of the generalist designer. And this is a reflection on a conversation that I had with some coworkers, uh, really about the death of being a generalist in graphic design or communication design, whatever you want to call it. Um, And the sort of overarching theme of this conversation and some context for my opinions and perspectives on this is um, I was speaking with a coworker who's actually, well, several coworkers who have actually made careers or are attempting to make careers as generalist designers. And the definition of that is, um, you know, just being someone who makes mostly print media, mostly um, long form Word documents, uh, things like that. Um, But before, I'm just gonna stick to my notes and delete this. Because I've got, oh, no, delete that recording. Because uh, I want to introduce myself. Okay. So welcome to season two, episode one, Death of the Generalist Designer. A little bit about me. My name is Curtis, and I am sort of a designer. But if you ask me, it's a very broad definition of that word design. But I kind of use that word instead of labeling myself as an artist, uh, because the things that I like to do in terms of new media and old media usually are for someone, are for a client. And sometimes that client is myself, right? Like Creative Crunch is my podcast and I'm the voice and the producer and the client behind this. Um, But sometimes and most often than not, it's for other people. It's for the design studio that I work at downtown. Uh, It's for um, other artists and other creative individuals. And in design, I mean a very, very like 10,000 foot up definition of design. It can extend into a lot of different things and it can mean a lot of different things, which is why my perspectives and my opinions on this death of a generalist designer 
are going to be coming from a very new media perspective and they're going to be coming from my set of experiences in photography, audio production, graphic design, uh, fine art, communication design, event production, things of that nature. I will design anything and I will treat anything as a client and I will treat anything as a canvas. And so I just want you to kind of have that context going into this and talking about uh, what it means to be a generalist designer, what it means to be a specialist and to be a hyper specialist. I think you could even uh, put a hyphen in there and um, add that to it. But just a little bit about myself, if you are joining us brand new for season two, and if you're reoccurring uh, and you're coming back and you're joining us, I just wanted to give a fresh perspective because every time you uh, ask me that question, basically every three months, I've kind of got a new definition around it, around what I am and what I do. Now, a generalist designer is going to be somebody, um, when we're speaking about this throughout the episode, somebody who's really focused on text documents, print documents, long form documents, uh, pamphlets, books, things of that nature. Um, really, if you're a designer and you're kind of speaking that language with me, somebody who's spending a lot of time in InDesign, somebody who's maybe spending some time in Photoshop or Illustrator. Uh, but for design purposes, they're not really um, editing photography. They're not really doing web design, things of that nature. That's really what a generalist designer is. And that kind of definition is the past, right? Is is something that is really waning in lieu of being a new media designer or being a hyper specialist, right? A designer that really knows a lot of coding languages and can really um, work in web design and app development and UI and UIX and things of that nature, right? So we're really seeing a shift in the landscape of what it means to be a graphic designer or more broadly speaking, the definition that I love is a communication designer, right? Somebody who's able to take visual communication and extend that and really parlay a message to an audience. Um, so this conversation comes from uh, my reflections on uh, breakfast with a couple of coworkers, one who has established a 20 year career in printmaking, print design, book design and things like that. And whose firm has only recently evolved into things like uh, buys, like buying books for clients to stock their library. Uh, using books to inform the client's philosophy, interior design, signage, manufacturing, uh, things of that nature. And that's not in their skill set, but in their ability to assemble a team with that skill set. Uh, the recent acquisitions of bringing a industrial designer into the firm, uh, web designers into the firm, and uh, me as sort of the shop intern and sort of the face of their retail endeavors. Right. So I think that's really interesting to kind of see that. And that will kind of inform the conversation here. Sitting at the table was three uh, generalist designers, including the founder of the firm that I work at, who has had a 20 year career in this. Another individual who has had a long standing career as a generalist designer and is actually also an alumni of MSU Denver, like I am, and a very young generalist designer who focuses on illustration, but again, is really focused on the clients that need print work. And then the other half of the table are sort of now these new people like me, these um, specialists. I don't really like to call myself that. I really like calling myself a master of none, right? A jack of all trades uh, because of my willingness to learn. But me having sort of that accumulation of not only an associates in graphic design, but a bachelor's that I designed myself, which really focused on communication and marketing and uh, what that looks like in creative spaces and creative venues. And a web designer who not only can handle some of the client work for print, but can really expand that into these new media landscapes of web design, app development, and things like that, and things of that nature. So, um, that's really kind of what the balance of this conversation was. 
And I just wanted to provide that context. And I just wanted to take a quick second to apologize for all my stuttering and muttering. Um, it's been a minute. It's been a couple uh, weeks since I've sat down with the microphone and really banged out an episode. So I really just wanted to uh, say thanks for bearing with me as I get through this. I do have notes. If you're watching the live stream, that's what I'm constantly staring at is I just made a list of notes because I really want to hit all of these points for you guys and really provide a full reflection on this conversation and what it means to be a generalist designer and the need for adaptation uh, to sort of specialize yourself or like me, become a master of none and really be able to dabble in all of these different areas and create kind of a unique combination of skills. So thank you for um, sticking with us in the first couple of minutes here. We're gonna take a quick break and then I'm gonna talk about how to combat becoming a generalist designer and how you can really uh, fight that urge to settle and to really um, always never stop learning as I have here written in my notes. So we're just gonna take a quick break and we're gonna jump in right after this little sound bite on how to combat becoming a generalist. Okay. Okay. We're doing great. We are doing awesome. Okay. So as I kind of prefaced before the little audio jumped there, um, being a generalist designer in 2019 and moving forward really isn't, uh, in my opinion, a healthy mindset, right? You shouldn't just be settling to be a communication designer. And if we're talking quickly to all my friends and creatives in college and those seeking higher education, uh, master's and doctorate's programs and things of like that, this is for you guys real quick. This means not accepting your art program and your art degree for what it is, okay? This means that college and higher education in particular is a game. It's a very complex game, I'll give you that. It can be like chess sometimes, but it's a game. And if you're still in college, if you're thinking about college, if you just graduated from high school, now is the time to not just accept a BFA program for what a BFA program is. It's time to challenge that curriculum and to challenge those standards and to really push yourself as an abstract thinker and a critical thinker to see what can make you most marketable in the industries moving forward that you wanna go into or that hopefully you're already a part of, right? There's, there's no distinction for me between oh, being a student and being a creative person, being an artist, being a designer. Those two things can interplay. You can get gigs that pay right now while you're seeking your education, and that makes you a creative professional, right? So same mentality when it comes to your education. Challenge the curriculum. Is that BFA program, are those classes that they want you to take in sequential order really worth it, right? Is it really going to make you marketable, and is it really going to satisfy the next 20, 30 40 years of your life in the industry, right? Is it going to set you up for success? This is my logic behind doing an associates in graphic design, taking a break, doing stuff on walls, figuring out that business is going to be really good at me succeeding in the next thing and applying to MSU Denver. But while I was there, you know, experimenting with letterpress, experimenting with communication, uh, things like that. So really 
just for my people seeking education, in education, about to do whatever with higher education, challenge yourself so that you do not become a generalist. You do not want to take all of this time, money, energy, and effort to just pop out on the other end and you've got a degree that everyone else has that really is no reason to have a conversation about because we all know what you are, we all know what you do. Do not accept the defaults. Seek out and challenge yourself in other ways, right? So that's just for my people in education. In general, for everyone who is a graphic designer or who is creative, you need to combat becoming a generalist every single day. And this is accomplished by having the desire to never stop learning. You need to push yourself, right? You need to look for clients that are on the fringe of your skill set that make you uncomfortable, right? You need to push for projects that make you uncomfortable and force you to spend non-billable hours watching YouTube videos, cracking open software in the Adobe suite or whatever you use that you don't really use that you're paying for, right? That $30 a month for the Creative Cloud suite affords you access to all of this software, all of these resources, all of these video tutorials, all of these creative assets, and you need to consistently push yourself to open new software, to try new things, to go and explore other Adobe assets that you're already paying for in your monthly subscription, right? That is one thing right there that you already have and that you're already billing yourself for and auto deducting $30 a month or more if you're in an enterprise that you really need to push yourself to use. And my example of this was in college at Colorado Mountain College, I experimented with Muse, Adobe Muse, and I don't even know if that's around anymore, but it was like this front end, easy to design website thing. And it's probably evolved into other stuff by now, but you've got to push yourself to open those things and experiment with them. Another great avenue to do this is download the Adobe apps onto your mobile device onto your iPad Pro, onto whatever you're using. There's a whole nother suite of Adobe mobile applications that can maybe actually enhance your workflow, that can uh, expand your creative thinking, can really challenge you. Uh, there's all sorts of apps. I, I personally recommend things like Adobe Capture and Adobe Spark. Those two can be great just jumping off points especially Adobe Capture because it's basically like a very intelligent camera. And as creative people, I don't think we're able to turn our brains off when we're out in the world. And so if you see typography that you enjoy, if you see a color palette in nature that you're really thinking, oh, I should use that for later, instead of just leaving that floating around in your human brain, which will easily forget it by the time you're having dinner that night, Open up Adobe Capture, take a photo, and pull the color palette from there, and it will actually put it in your CC library so the next time you're illustrating uh, or designing, you can just have that palette from your adventure at the Botanic Gardens in there. You can have the reds from those flowers. You can have the greens from those leaves. You can have the blues from those skies accessed right then and there. So really combat becoming a generalist by using the Adobe assets as a designer that you're already paying for. I didn't even have a note for that in my notepad, but that just came to me on how influential changing up the app landscape that you use can be, right? Like just add a different application to your mix and see how that shakes up your creative thinking. And that will be the easiest way to combat becoming a generalist because then who knows what you can come up with. You might start developing your own typefaces. You're going to start having these color palettes that you're using to define your style that nobody else has because they're from your photographs and your experiences from when you were learning, 
right? And, and another extension of this is to always, 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 always seek knowledge. Seek knowledge in conversation. Seek knowledge in creative venues, in non-creative venues. Push the limits of where you go to learn and to always continually from womb to tomb, never stop seeking knowledge, right? This is going to Denver Startup Week. That was my, you know, seeking knowledge and to push myself when I was unemployed and to kind of continue the ethos of a college lecture into my professional life. You need to go to things like Creatives at Roundish Tables, which is hosted by Mo Graham and Odessa Nomadic, right? Like you need to go to conversations and lectures of various calibers and degrees. And again, same thing with your creative process. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Go to a science lecture on quantum physics and yada da 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 that you don't understand and just see what you can take away from that and see what might happen. Maybe their PowerPoints are really boring and you're thinking, oh man, I could really up the PowerPoint game and that might actually help the science knowledge communicate to a broader audience. Or you might just see a really crazy equation with lots of insane typesetting where things are subset and in parentheses and brackets and yada, 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 and just expanded. And like then you see the parts of the equation labeled and maybe that influences how you typeset the next gig poster you have to do for your friend's punk band right? Like just expose yourself to different kinds of knowledge and don't pigeonhole yourself into going to roundtable discussions or conversations that are other like-minded people, other graphic designers, all just kind of playing this weird game of trying to one-up each other with obscure references and projects and things like that. Because I've been to those, you know, and they serve their purpose too. For me, they're very humbling and they push me to, if I go to something that's mostly graphic designers or creative people, then it pushes me to also go to something else weird and outside of my comfort zone, right? Because you go to these conversations sometimes, and again, this is my opinion, and these are the things that I'm noticing. When you go to conversations that are all creative people all the time, it becomes this weird one-up of like, do you know about that project? Oh, do you know this guy and that designer? And it almost becomes like this battle of wits in a way to see who knows the most about design. And that really doesn't progress the conversation into uncomfortable territory, right? And that's the whole point of getting multiple humans in a room is to share these perspectives and to get uncomfortable. And sometimes that doesn't happen, right? So on that note, I just want to encourage you to be brave and to try. Get uncomfortable and always seek that discomfort. I've been rambling for 11 minutes and I know that can be a lot. So we're going to take a break and then we're going to tackle being a critical thinker and being an abstract thinker and how that can help you combat being a generalist designer. I think we're doing great. We're doing great. We're getting through it. We've got a couple more bullet points. I want to tackle becoming uh, using that critical and abstract thinking. Um, how you can excel and making yourself marketable, and then we're done. I think we're doing really good. Yeah, and I, I think shorter episodes are going to be good too. Like Thirty-minute episodes are going to be a lot better.
try to find oh, something a little longer here than I could. So let's do that. All right, so this is going to be the last little segment for this episode. I was just reflecting on YouTube that I think um, shorter episodes are going to be a little bit better, maybe like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and really I'm not going to try to push it any longer than it needs to be because I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time, right? So now we're going to tackle this amazing skill set of being a critical thinker and being an abstract thinker. Because if you're a graphic designer and you're in the creative inter industries, you already are these things, right? I don't like to use the word talent because it suggests some kind of divinity, but critical thinking and abstract thinking are something that are usually part of our innate curiosity. And then if we're fortunate enough, are nurtured by others throughout our education and throughout our lives and you know, by your parents and by your art teachers and things like that. So you are already listening to this episode. You are already an amazing critical thinker and an abstract thinker. And I'm just going to slow the cadence for a minute to let that sink in because you are right. You've gotten this far in your career. You've done this many design projects. You've handled this many client relationships. You've gotten this many paychecks from critical thinking and abstract thinking alone which means that using these skill sets of critical and abstract thinking outside of design will also help you combat becoming a generalist designer, right? Being able to see life as a blank Photoshop document, as a blank InDesign document will help you excel in just seeking that knowledge and seeking that discomfort, right? Think of your brain and the way you think as a creative problem and see what abstract solutions you can come up with to expanding your neurodiversity and really pushing that neuroplasticity, right? Same thing, be critical about your own creative process and see what steps are missing, what steps are outdated, and what steps need to be added. Your creative process should constantly be evolving with you as you age and as you get closer to the end, right? Because we're all going to get there. There is an end to this. And do you want to look back saying, I didn't push myself, I didn't continue to learn, once I got my degrees, I was done learning? Or do you want to say, I constantly was critical of myself and my creative processes, and that pushed me to create abstract solutions, which resulted in a larger career, a bigger breadth, a bigger depth in work that you do, whatever your goals are, did you critically look at them, set goals, and abstractly think about the solutions to these like you do when somebody asks you to make a gig poster for their punk band? I guess that's the analogy for this episode. I think it's very approachable uh, because at one point or another, if you're a graphic designer, somebody's going to be asking you to make a poster for their band's gig uh, at the Larimer Lounge or whatever it is. You know, and are you just going to approach that by looking at all the posters that were done before? Or are you going to approach it by having a conversation with this band and pushing their ethos and their philosophy into the extension of their design? And I'm going to tell you right now, the latter is going to help you build a relationship with this band, right? And it's going to help you blossom into being the designer that helps give an identity to their sound. If you do the first by just Googling punk gig posters, 
that's just going to get you that one gig with that one band. If you don't bring something new and you don't illustrate to them that you are a critical thinker and that you're an abstract thinker and that you're invested in their philosophy and ethos, then there's no reason to return to you as a designer. You need to make yourself marketable. Okay. And that is straight from the notes. Are you going to be a designer that just bangs things out and sort of repeats history and doesn't push the envelope? Or are you going to make yourself so much mar- so more marketable, or however you want to phrase that, that this band now understands and you have a rapport with them, you have this back and forth, that they then want you to design other things, merchandise. Uh, what else does bands need? Stickers, ephemera of that nature, live visuals. That's huge, right? Because nobody's buying music anymore, the, the concert itself needs to be more of an experience. So can you as a designer enter those new media spaces and create those visuals for them? And it doesn't have to be award-winning. It can be as simple as using your skills as a critical and abstract thinker to say, not only can I make the graphics, but I will take on the effort of figuring out the logistics of what projector is going to be affordable and can get the job right and understanding lumens, right? Like as a designer, are you willing to critically think and abstract think and go and learn about light? Because it's a particle and a wave. That's insane. You know, can you help them solve the logistic problem of projector, computer, screen, and designing the visuals? Or are you just going to settle with the gig poster, right? So really take those skill sets that you have of being able to turn a blank document into a beautiful piece of design that effectively communicates a message and push it. Push, 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 push. Constantly push. And your clients will see that. The great clients will respect that. And they'll come back to you time and time again, not only with the simple basic projects, but with ideas and with their musical philosophy. And then you as a designer who can critically and abstract think can create these solutions and push the boundaries of what it means to be a punk band in 2019. Make yourself marketable. You are completely capable of it. Again, I'm slowing down so that this sinks in and you realize that your degrees, your set of experiences, your knowledge, your influence, your philosophy, your research all contribute to making yourself a marketable designer and will again combat you from becoming a generalist. Generalists settle. Generalists say, I am comfortable here, here, and here, and this is what I do, right? And the person I was having this conversation with probably realizes this perspective, but didn't really share it in the moment. They themselves do push themselves, and they push themselves by surrounding themselves with employees that bring a diverse skill set to the table. I know for a fact, since I have started this job, I have educated this designer on photography and videography, and we've actually learned together. I had to reopen the textbook on time lapse and how to make a time lapse and how to film a time lapse and how to kind of do it from the old school way of still photographs with a DSLR and an intervalometer, right? But then After doing that, I pushed the envelope and introduced them into Hyperlapse, the Instagram application, which is just an updated take on time lapse. Well, what's great about Hyperlapse is it gives you speed control, right? And you can do this from your mobile device. So now this designer, when they're traveling or when they're doing a lecture or what have you, when they want to show the lapse of time, 
they no longer need a DSLR, an intervalometer, a, a tripod, spare batteries, this kind of lens, that kind of thing. They can do it all from their iPhone. So I just want to give credit to that person. I don't know if they'll ever listen to this, but they do push themselves. And I really do not think that they are a generalist designer like they labeled themselves. I think at the beginning of their career, maybe the first 10 years of their design career, they were probably a generalist. But now creating this business and creating a design studio and a firm and a print shop around it, they have found a way to combat their own ability to be a generalist. And you see this in their portfolio of work. Again, it is a it's expanded into interior design and manufacturing and all sorts of unique and innovative letterpress printing techniques. So again, don't be a generalist. Combat that by always seeking knowledge, being brave, trying new things, going to free lectures, auditing a class, going back to community college and just taking a weird three credit, you know, just do stuff like that. Force yourself to abstract and critical think around you as a person, right? You are the longest running design project you will ever have as a graphic designer. You are going to be your own longest client. You're going to spend the most time the most energy and the most resources on you. And so you need to push yourself to creatively think and to abstractly think around that because you are your biggest expenditure and your biggest investment, right? If you were to itemize yourself, and maybe you need to do this, I think it could be healthy, creating an Excel spreadsheet around you and what time you're taking and what resources you're using to invest in you as a designer. Because like I have said before, with this analogy of the punk band, clients will respect that. The great clients that see your ethos and want to mirror that ethos and share their philosophy will see that you are making an investment in you and you're truly bringing something unique to the table, right? So we're just going to take a quick break again as I blubber through all of this. And the last little tidbit I hope you stick around for because it's a lot of uh, just selfish promotion. And if you've enjoyed this episode right after the break, I'm going to sh share with you how you can kind of stay connected with season two of Creative Crunch and you can stay connected with me. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope this has been beneficial. Uh, stay tuned after the jump because uh, I would love to get connected with some of you guys and your support and your listening means everything. Cool, I just crashed Anchor to these damn sponsored segments. Okay. Sponsorships. Okay. So I'm going to just 
throw a sponsored segment in here. Okay. Okay. All right, welcome back. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for making it all the way through this episode, for listening to it. Thank you to everyone on YouTube who's been watching the live stream. Uh, you can stay connected with me, Curtis Crunch, on Instagram. That's my handle, at Curtis Crunch. I'm sharing a lot of street photography uh, lately. That's been my big passion as I walk to and from work is just to take photos of Denver as it grows and changes and the people in Denver and things like that. But then if you want a little secret, you go to my profile and you go over to the tagged photos, you'll start seeing all the work that I do with models. And when I go to meetups and things like that, I really let them share those photos because they are in them and then just tag me. So it's actually a whole nother gallery on my Instagram page. If you go to my profile and you go over to the tagged photo section, you'll see a completely different body of photography work. And I am available for hire. So if you go onto my YouTube channel, you can see that I do studio visits with artists and I can document your creative space and your creative process. I'm also comfortable capturing uh, relationships, uh, any kind. I'm open to anybody, any structure, LGBTQIA+, whatever you are, uh, work portraits, if you need headshots, anything like that. I am available for hire. The best way to kind of get at me is through Instagram. Just shoot me a DM with your idea. Again, it's at Curtis Crunch. And then if you want to uh, kind of get into seeing Creative Crunch episodes, check out my YouTube channel, which is linked in the anchor descriptions and is on my Facebook and everything else. And I'm going to figure out how to get that onto Instagram somehow. Uh, but you can watch Creative Crunch episodes. Uh, there, you can also see some of the vlogs that I've started to make. I've got another one in the works. It's a mukbang. That's new territory for me, so that'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, and I'm just trying to grow YouTube over 2019, um, despite all the controversy on that platform. I just want to start making more videos, and, and maybe they'll migrate somewhere else. But for right now, I've got a YouTube channel that's linked in the anchor page, and I can make sure you guys see that. Uh, so that's a great way to stay connected with me and to kind of see the work that I'm doing uh, with my photography. And I am exploring more and more design uh, outside of my job, right? In my personal design, I have sketchbooks on my nightstand and I'm trying to work it up to actually drawing again and things like that. Another great way that you can support me is if you loved season one, if you enjoyed this episode and you went back and you listened to some of season one, um, there's actually a way to support me through anchor.fm uh, slash creative crunch. You can go there and you can give uh, a donation of like 99 cents. That's really all I'm asking for. I'm not asking for the other tiers right now, but if you could afford it, 99 cents a month actually helps creative crunch grow. And as I've said in the supporter message, it will go directly to the costs for Creative Crunch. Some of those costs are, like I've mentioned before, Creative Cloud membership. That's $30 a month. And I use that a lot um, in video production, in design production, in editing my photos. I use Lightroom all the time. Um, so 99 cents times 30, you know, could really just wipe that bill away off of my table and that would be great i would really appreciate that and then once we get that barrier crossed uh with all the extra money i would buy start buying tickets to things right like i would take my own advice and start going to not only free things but things that you have to pay to get into lectures um, museum exhibitions whatever you guys want to recommend if you want to send me somewhere uh, make a monthly donation and just, again, shoot me an Instagram DM and say, hey, I think you should go to this thing and it only costs 10 bucks to get in. I'll buy that ticket. I'll go. And then I'll make a Creative Crunch episode about what I learned and my opinions on what I learned from that thing that you sent me to. So those are some great ways that you can stay connected. Um, you can continue to listen to this. If you found something useful in this, 
tweet about it, share it on Instagram, tell your friends about Creative Crunch. That will really help this grow into something organic. Again, because I'm begging for money, I don't have a marketing budget for this uh, per se. I'm not spending money on any kind of advertising. I just do it all organically through my own platforms. So if you could do the same, I really think that could help us achieve our goal of getting Creative Crunch to a larger audience, right? So I just wanted to say thank you for listening to this. I would love to hear your thoughts, your comments, your concerns, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations. You can actually do that on the Anchor F, uh, Anchor app as well. You can send me an audio message and I can work that into the episode if you want to be brave and do that. There's just a million different ways to support Creative Crunch and you're already doing it by listening. So I'm just asking for a little bit of extra effort. Um, in helping this grow into something bigger uh, because I love doing this. I love talking to you guys. I love seeing the interactions and the conversations, and I'm really excited to get season two going. Thanks so much. We will see you guys next week when we tackle some other creative art industry thing, right? Uh, so thank you so much and have a great rest of your week. Stay creative. All right, so that pretty much wraps up the episode. I'm going to do some boring stuff on Anchor logistically, just kind of get the description up to date and get it all published. Uh, you can listen to that on anchor.fm slash creative crunch. I think there's also a link to it in this live stream, and there's also a link to it in the creative crunch playlist. If you want to go back in time and watch all the other live streams that I used to do and some of the interviews from season one, uh, you can do that there. Thanks so much for watching this live stream and uh, we will see you guys next week.